And I'm like 18. And I'm like, I could have taught this in like an hour, a $15,000 course. I could have taught it in an hour mm-hmm. on stage, like on stage in front of and as many people as you want to throw at me. So I, I that experience and many others have made me realize that some of the people you, that you're envying or that you're jealous of, that you're like, oh my God, they're so successful. It's crazy, but they're not where you think they are. So don't worry about what other people are doing. I would just tell myself and other people, focus on yourself and realize that you can charge and be a lot more than you already are um, because you're already worth more than you are compared to the people you probably are jealous of or or want to be like. (laughs) Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. Today is a conversation that you're going to like if you're an entrepreneur or you're aspiring to be an entrepreneur. Today, we're joined by John Weberg. John, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. We were chatting for like 20 minutes before this. I'm ready to just just go, go, go. (laughs) Awesome. Sounds good. Well, you know, let's start off by uh, learning a bit about you. Mm -hmm. Who is John Weberg? I thought about this as I was reading your description and as you told me about it. John Weber, because there's so many different ways you can answer this question, is someone who cares, genuinely cares about other people. He's someone who wants to make people laugh. He happens to be a business guy who's pretty decent at what he does. And a uh, lover of all food, just about other than maybe Brussels sprouts. Everything else is pretty dang good. Um, and just like to have a good time. And also, like I said earlier, already really good at business stuff. Marketing, sales, uh, growth consulting, you name it. Awesome. Well, I kind of want to go back to the beginning. And, uh, you know, prior to you getting into business, you described what you overcame as being immense poverty. So first, yes. can we kind of can we kind of level set and get your definition of what immense poverty is before we talk about how you overcame that? Yeah, so don't get me wrong. Definitely a lot of people have things way worse, 100%. But it was, it was pretty bad, so... When in 08, when there was the housing crisis, real estate housing crisis, which by the way, there's one that's going to happen very soon. But regardless, back in 08, my dad, Richard Weberg, had two uh, stores, offline stores, uh, selling like sports memorabilia, sports uh, clothing, jerseys, you know, all that good stuff. And they went bankrupt. He went bankrupt. Our family lost everything. Uh, the repo man took our cars. We were living in someone else's basement in welfare apartments. Um, we had to sell our TV, you know, we were selling everything we had barely moving by. Um, so that was kind of the first time there's been two times. That was the first time pretty much other than being homeless, pretty close. Um, and my dad, of course, we have three sons, three sons, and it was my mom and dad. So that happened. And then a little bit after a while after when I was around 17, 18, actually when I was involved with business, I was uh, not doing great at business. I was doing okay. I moved on my own. Uh, I was supporting my girlfriend. She was kind of, at the time, she was kind of working, kind of not. And I was going on a lot of trips to expand the business. And then after going on one of the trips, I came back and I knew my money was tight, but I had like 50 bucks left. And I was like, oh, time to crack down. So yeah, there's been two times. The first one was a little, a little more rough, but I was younger, so I didn't experience it all the way. Versus the second time I actually had to get myself out of it versus more of my dad getting my family out of it. Okay. Awesome. Well, now let's talk about how, well, I guess let's start with the first experience, like your dad and how he, how he got you out of that. Cause I have a, you know, I have a similar story with my dad, but it wasn't, you know, not quite as extreme, but I'd uh-huh. love to hear how you guys came out of that. Right. So basically it came down to one, I believe at one time he was working three jobs. Uh, and my mom, I believe is working one or two jobs as well. They were both just, doing what most people don't do or or won't do or aren't willing to do, even if they aren't in that kind of situation, unfortunately, is they decide they're going to work their asses off nonstop, do everything they could to move the family forward. Obviously budgeting, once you don't, when you don't have that much money, budgeting is kind of number one, other than earning more money. And two, like I said, they, they started selling our TV. No, my dad was thinking, well, do we need to watch TV or do I need money for the family? Get rid of the TV. We got to put food on the table. 
Um, so I think that was a big part of it. And two, also my dad turned to, which is kind of how I got started in it a little bit. He turned to online marketing and sales. And me seeing that as we kind of progressed, and my dad, really hardworking people, uh, my dad, my mom, as I saw them kind of transition us out of that, thank God, I was thinking, well, maybe I could do something like this. Because in the online world, especially earlier, and I mean, there is now, but I feel like there's a little bit less. There's a lot of uh, a prep and show and lifestyle and traveling and all the stuff, especially with certain influencers stuff. And I saw that and I'm like, that was my first intrigue into getting into business. Mm -hmm. And then interesting because after going through it as a child and then bring yourself to when you're on your own. And yeah. I mean, oh my goodness, I'm thinking when I was uh, 17, 18, wow, what was I doing? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. No, it, it's, been, it's been a crazy journey. And I usually hear that like when I, when I go to events or I'm traveling or something, people are usually like, you're so young and you have like this kind of crazy, kind of different lineage story and it's not normal. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that will, I guess, lead to the second part. So around 14, 15, I started getting more entrepreneurial like in school. I actually convinced my teacher, I've convinced my teachers to do many cool things um, <laughs> for like weeks on end. We would go to the computer lab and I started my own blog and I was like 13, 14. I got her to let me teach the entire class how to start their own blog and how to start doing SEO and different things. Really young, right? So started doing that, started getting more serious around 15, 16. I worked my first and only job ever at Walmart. Thank you, Walmart, for six months. All the money I earned, invested in my 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 business with a friend from school, went horrible, lost all my money. Okay, back to the drawing board. Um, and during this time, I think a big reason I didn't succeed that first initial time, and I tell everyone this, when you're younger, anyone who's listening to this who's younger or just kind of has a chip on their shoulder, like, I don't need to listen to mm -hmm. my parents or my friends or whatever. That's sometimes the case. But if you have someone who's looking out for you, who you know for sure has your best interests in mind and their good best interests, Listen, because my dad kept offering me help, you know, every like few months, he'd be like, son, I know things are going so good. Would you like me to help you? And I was like, no, nah, trust me. I got it. Leave me alone. Um, which around 16 then, I said, you know what, dad, I put all this money into it from working at Walmart. Could you help me a little bit? We kind of teamed up. He helped me out. And then from there, we still have a affiliate marketing business we both run. But then I started moving to 16, 17. Uh, doing more freelancer work, 17, 18, and one of those trips that I told you about, well, spend a lot of money. And now <laughs> I've learned since then, around 18 up, it's been all blessings, um, getting more into consulting, getting more into more serious business, I would call it. And yeah, it's been a, a incredible experience to say the least. And I just have to ask, so being that age, because I'm really stuck on that, <laughs> how, yeah, did, yeah. how did you land your first clients, I guess, right? Like, were they not a little hesitant? Did you give one of those extreme discounts? Right, how right. right. I'll give 95% off. Please hire me. This is the first thing. <laughs> and I didn't do that. Um, I actually landed a really big client, I guess, um, when I was, oh, there's two stories. I'll go. I'll try to go through them quickly. Sometimes I talk a lot. There's two things. <laughs> one. I landed when I was 18, it was 17 or 18, 80, an $8,700 freelance project, which obviously at the time, especially for me, I was like, oh, this, this is some big money. <laughs> um, that's when I landed that too. I was like, these guys are paying me money like this much? Like, how is that possible? Just to also show real quickly, anyone who is going to get into an entrepreneurship journey or start a business or do anything like that, one, whether or not people know you, they will buy from you if they buy from a 17-year-old or 18-year-old. Two, people will pay the price that you want to charge. Um, so I think one, what my dad, my dad was a huge influence in that kind of stuff. So he kind of led me down the path of like, just do it, get over it. Don't care what other people think, other than the good ones, and just focus on what you want what I need to do to get that to happen. So he said, son, there's this guy. He told me to, to call him. I want you to call him. I'm like, I don't know what to say. He goes, doesn't matter. Just be yourself. And this is my number one business thing that I've learned. I've done well that resonates and does really good in business itself. So I called him and I was just, 
I'm sure I probably sounded like this because, you know, I was still partially probably going through puberty. And I was just this young little kid. And I talked to the guy. I chatted. I told him everything I knew. Uh, and about halfway through, he goes, you know, I'm buying. I go, huh? He goes, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I just, I just like your style. I like how um, you're talking to me like a real person. Big thing there. And you know what? I, I want in. Let's do this. And I was like amazed. Okay. <laughs> um, so I discovered what the, what the secret is in all business and just in life too, relationships, um, anything someone's doing, whether it's talking with friends, family, the spouses, uh, you're trying to make a deal on a discount on the four wheeler. It doesn't matter. You know, anything. Um, what I did best and how I landed both those deals, one was for 8,700. Uh, it was for a company called Influencer Inc., and the other one was for, I think, two grand, a guy named Neil. I forgot his last name. It's been a while. <laughs> um, and I'm, uh, what I discovered is I was just being myself, and I also happened to be decently charismatic at times. Um, so I, I was just being myself. I wasn't trying to really hard sell. I was more of this works, again, with everything. When you're trying to have someone you are talking with do something you want, you have to lead with what they want. You have to lead with how can I get them what they want? And that happens to be what I want. So I'm really good at kind of talking, communicating, making a deal. So I was able to just be myself, be genuine, make them laugh, see I'm a real person. And it, it worked out. And then around, I think, 18, I discovered, oh, I should just always do this. And it will, it will work out really good for me. <laughs> no, that's, that's awesome. Now, the other thing too is, you know, you talk a lot of, as well about being able to start a business with very limited or yeah. no capital to start off. Can you, can you unpack that for us a bit? Yes. You're 100% spot on. That's kind of how I've learned so much in business is because how we start out with nothing, we had to learn how to do everything. And then again, a lot of entrepreneurs start out like that is like, well, I don't know anything about, see, I'm going I'm to start a power washing business. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know how to start an LLC. I don't know how to run the business. I don't know how to add, you know, like get employees. I don't know how to do my taxes, any of those things. So before anyone gets in business, I prescribe, and this is what I did. I went on a massive learning adventure. Like I learned from every single marketer and salesperson I knew. So like Tony Robbins, I, I learned from Frank Kern. I learned from many of the, of the greats. And I think anyone going into any industry, whether it's a job, a nine to five or entrepreneurship, become the master at what you do. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things too, is even at a young age, why people listen to me most of the time. Uh, who are older is I actually sounded like I knew what I was talking about because I, I learned so much about the topic. So that's what I did with, with so little money is I decided, okay, I don't have the money. I'm gonna have to do these things myself. I could probably hire them out or, or work extra to you know make it happen, but I'd rather do it myself because this is something really important, I think, in businesses. And I think it's why more corporate stuff gets really muddy is as you get more into serious, more serious business, quote unquote, it's hard if you're a higher up to, unless you've already learned and mastered every part of the business, it's hard for you to help other people who are operating with you to do their job. So it, say, for example, uh, there's an agency. And they're, of course, you know, there's their sales department, their HR department, there's their marketing team, their advertising team, you name it. If I'm someone who's managing those teams, I need to understand how each of them works. Because if I don't, how can I know how to tell you how to do your job better if I have no idea what you're doing? Um, so long story short, I had to learn everything myself. And I think people have to embrace that grind. They have to embrace that transference of knowledge to be willing to do those things. It's kind of the, the tuition you pay to be successful in anything you do. You got to get good at it. Um, especially with relationships, especially mm -hmm. with relationships. Those, those things can be all types of crazy, good or bad. Well, I totally agree with that. Right. Because if you're alert, if you have that new business and people start asking you questions, wanting to talk with you and you don't know those answers, they're going to pick that up right off the spot. Right. right? right. Especially right. if it takes you like 10 minutes to be like, Oh, exactly. let me. <laughs> exactly. But if you know what you're talking about, you can fake it. So you make it for real. Right. right. But that at least you've put that time in and you actually know what you're talking about. Somebody's going to say, okay, the products you have or the services you have make sense. 
the price makes sense, right? So I right. definitely agree with that. You got to put that time in. Yeah, you got to put time in, I think, to an in-depth level. Because also as well, then, you'll even impress people more because even the people who are older than you, who have more experience, who've been in the industry for years, you'll still sound more educated and smarter than them. So yeah, in-depth, in-depth is the best. It's it's done very well for me, thank God. Um, I, I'm glad I started er learning really young and I'll hold my hands up. I still have a lot to learn. I don't want to be one of those young kids who are like, I'm the best, trust me. <laughs> yeah, because uh, just to confirm, so you're 24? I'm 24. Yeah, okay. I'm getting old now. <laughs> I'm getting old. I'm getting there. <laughs> no, that's amazing. So another piece I just want to bring up. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have many different businesses. And you do see that nowadays that, you know, some people get into a few different things. But then, like, for me personally, my thought is like, you know, how much time do does somebody divide between one or two or right. up to four, you know, how much energy are you putting into these? Right. So I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. How are you, how are you yeah. spinning so many plates? Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, what's been working for you? How am I spinning so many plates? One, I put in a lot of hours. I'm not afraid to, uh, but I think for most people, the best thing to do, honestly, I would, I would not start out with four. I would start out with one. Um, the reason I was able to branch out into four, I think, is because I mastered all these different things. So I could I could do freelancing while I ran my affiliate marketing business because I had those skills so in depth. But I would advise anyone, because like you're saying, especially nowadays, people venture to two, three, four. They venture out into, well, I could do this, I can do this, I can do this. But truly, what works best is if you if you master one mm -hmm. and then start branching out. Because again, then you have so much more in-depth knowledge at a a higher level because you were more successful in this one thing you singularly focused on that you can branch out because, okay, maybe you started this power washing business. You got to a point where you have employees, you even hire a manager to manage them. So you're kind of just doing higher up stuff. Um, you have advertising running, you have follow-up running to keep landing clients, all those different things. Now that you have a solid business in place of some kind of online or offline, now you can take a look at starting a second business. Um, and two, again, I think it comes down to really time management. And I hate that word because it's so cliche. Like, you got to manage your time, obviously. But I think it comes truly down to what you are willing to sacrifice to not do. Like, for me, like, I go party. I'm not much for party. I never have been. Even when I was younger. I, I think I, I first had a sip of alcohol when I was legit 18. It was crazy. Um I think you have to decide what you're going to do with your time. So a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, usually you hear the nine to five people go party on the weekend. Everyone goes party on the weekend. Come on. Um, is people have partying you want to do. You want to spend time with your kids, which is important. You should, should spend time with your kids. You spend, should spend time with your spouses. You should do all those things. But for example, scrolling through Facebook, scrolling on TikTok, which is the worst. I spend at least an hour a day on TikTok and I absolutely hate it. <laughs> um, there's a lot of little things we do, I think, to like minute time at time management that we just waste and waste and waste. Um, so I think optimizing what's good for that is optimizing how you spend your time. What I do to make sure I spend time with my girlfriend to make sure I spend time with family. So I have time to go travel and go do other things is I follow what I call a result producing schedule. There's many different words for it. That's what I call it. Uh, which is basically for however many hours of the day, which usually if you're following something like this and you're actually following it, you only need to be working for five, six hours if you have an entrepreneurial kind of journey you're on. Um, it's only filled with things that produce results in my business. So I'm either emailing clients, I'm either sending follow-up emails to my affiliate marketing business, I'm either writing SEO articles, I'm doing some kind of actual action. I can measure this is producing content, this is producing leads, this is producing customers, this is producing some kind of metric for me. And by doing that and making sure you're not popping this phone out every five minutes to, oh, I got a text, oh, I got this. Just focus on solely that. You'll save a lot of time, have more to spend on another business, or have more time to spend with friends, family, you name it. So being good at what you do. Well, one more thing. Once you define that schedule, what works good is you optimize how fast you can get those things accomplished. So just getting efficient at being efficient in each of those individual tasks, that also makes things look a lot quicker. For example, it used to take me an hour to write an email. I can now write a copywritten good email in about five minutes. 
Great. Yeah. So, so it's kind of, I guess, kind of finding that balance of being effective while being efficient at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Efficient, being effective, and you do need to take breaks. There does need to be some time where you, like, you can't not, you can't neglect your family. You can't neglect the people you care about. Like, they're not going to be too happy. And they're not going to let you off the hook for that. <laughs> um, I used to be really bad at getting back to people, like texting them back and calling them back because I was so focused on business. I've gotten a little bit better at that now. I make sure I message people back. I make sure I get back to them. Um, because, again, what are you working your business for? Your family, your friends, your lifestyle, things you want. And that's what you go back to when you're not in business is these are the things you actually care about that mean the most. Mm -hmm. So with that schedule, then, after those five hours, Mm -hmm. what uh, do you do with the rest of the time? And then you have to sleep in there. <laughs> Me, personally, I, I probably sleep six to seven. And then usually me, because I'm I'm crazy, I just I just keep working on business after. <laughs> Unless I have something planned, like maybe there's an event on the weekend or we're going to go spend, spend time with family. Maybe I'm going to cook something up. Um, either A, I just keep doing more business. Um, but then at that point, it's more of not like I'm hyper-focused. I'm just casually doing stuff maybe i'm checking yeah. my phone a little bit more then um but also game i game a lot i love gaming it's just i think it, it's just enjoyable my age group all age groups is the best um so playstation by the way playstation is way better than xbox and also i play on my computer too um i'm a classic person my generation but game eat food love food and more business why not yeah, I know. Hey, whatever that balance is and whatever that looks like for people, I think it's great. And the difference is, especially if you've been that in that nine to five and then you come out and start, you know, start in the entrepreneurial world is you no longer have that boss. Right. Or that that figure, whether you're in your yeah. cubicle at your desk and all that. So really, it is that accountability of, of course, we all want our business to succeed, but it's a lot easier to be like, nah, you know, I don't have to keep going. I can go and do this. I can I go and game the, or whatever. Right. So that's I think, the hardest thing yeah. is keeping yourself actually committed to doing these things. Um, yeah. And I've thankfully not had to deal with a lot of the, like, I, I get the nine to five of like, there's almost like always an overarching figure you feel like right. watching that's monitoring you, that you have to make sure you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do, when you're doing it, how you're doing it. Um, and that's why I like, and I always prescribe people to get into business because you dictate what you do and you are fully responsible for where your business goes and how it goes. Um, for, you know, unless there's an economic collapse, even then you're still partially responsible. You should be prepared for something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's definitely, definitely a balancing game. Um, and I think I always prescribe people get into business, but also before you get into business, if anyone who's listening, um, be careful only because starting a business will be a huge journey. I, I do advise people do it. And I think it's character building. It, it builds your communication skills far more than almost any other thing you can do, um, which I think communication skills are number one for any part of life. Um, yeah, starting a business is, there's so much more to it than most people think who have not ran it. There, there's, a lot. And as I've managed multiple businesses, I discovered there's even more depth and layers and it, it, it's crazy. But if you get good at it over the years, it is handsomely rewarding. Now, do, do you see any value in being an employee before you start a business? Like I, I know it's a little bit different in your scenario because, you know, you have that all that six months of experience at Walmart. <laughs> but w was there anything that was, uh, you know, that you took away from that experience that's been valuable for you in business? Yeah, I would actually say, I would prescribe for anyone, work a job or two before you start a business. And if you are going to start a business, work at the job to drive the business. Because with business, again, some things you, you, you can't tell what's going to happen. You may think you're in control, but if, if profits go down for three months, because some people go, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit my job, I'm going to start my business. They do that, they get a little bit of money, they get the business going, and then three months down the line, business drops, and they're like, oh, I'm screwed because I don't have any other income coming in. If I would have got started again, what I would have done is found the highest paying job possible. I don't really care where. Hopefully in the industry I'm trying to get my business into. I would find a job there, the highest possible one, for probably three years, even while the business is running. The first year, overtime as much as possible. 
Um, and every three to four months, I would ask to go to a higher up position. Like I'm constantly trying to move up, constantly trying to make more money. I want to raise, putting in the hours, putting in the effort, say at year or six months or a year, then I would start learning how to start the business. Maybe start doing, you know, create the LLC or, you know, start getting sales pages and websites created and different things. Um, and then while the business is running, even if it's running profitably and it becomes a wild success, I still think people should, before they really commit fully and, and say bye-bye to the job, they need to make sure they have a really, really consistent level income for a period of time in the business for, I would say, six months to a year, very consistent and hopefully at a growing pace. Okay, now I can say bye to the job. Make sure, making sure it actually replaces and then some the income that you're already earning and then commit full time to the business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree with that. Right. Because a lot of people are just like, okay, I'm quitting my job today. I'm going to start this. And like, whether you're 18, 24 or 40, not the smartest way to go about it. So it's nice to hear other people say like, mm -hmm. stick with what you have work it on the side, get into it. And I like that timetable of, of that six months to a year because right. yeah, you could be making a ton off the hop, you know, but you want to make sure that's consistent and you don't want it to be a stressful situation. Right. So like, right. when yeah, when that's all you're dependent on, especially if you do have children and all that, you know, mortgage, all that stuff, mm -hmm. then that, that makes, um, it takes the love and the joy away from what it is you're trying to do. And it yep, almost yep. puts you into that like sales mode or that push mode. All you're, the okay. time. you're in that sales and push mode. And it's almost, I, I would say it's almost worse than having the job. It's probably worse than having the job because now yeah. you are fully responsible. And you're, with the job, you get a consistent paycheck every single month. With the business, exactly. you don't, unless you, you, know, you do everything possible to make sure this thing is performing and functioning or optimized for growth. Um, yeah, you don't know what's coming in. So you have to make sure you are there, there, there showing up. I often compare and it's often compared like many famous people have said, and I think it's true that having a business is almost like having kids. You guys can relate because <laughs> I think for most business owners, it's always on your mind or at least pretty often on your mind. Like mm -hmm. I, I almost, my girlfriend gets embarrassed because like we'll go out to a restaurant or like uh, there is a... I live, in, I live in Minnesota. There's a small town called Walker. I live in very tiny. But when the summer's here, tourism, thousands and thousands and thousands of people come. Through. The population is like 2,000 people. And then there's, there's little events and stuff that pop up, right? And there's all these small businesses that are there. And my consulting minds are going, oh, how'd you get started? What are you doing now? Are you online? Are you doing any online marketing sales? Oh, you're not. Do you have a website up? Are you doing any SEO? And I, I start asking these questions. And then my girlfriend's like, can we just buy the cookies and just go to the, <laughs> go to the next stand, please? Um, so, yeah, I'm always just thinking business, um, which, again, isn't necessarily always good. You want to have an off mode. If I'm with friends and stuff, family, then I can usually turn it off at least for a little bit and enjoy myself. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, it's it's usually always on the mind because it's it's such an important part of your life. It's, it's like your job almost, but it has so much more potential to scale, which is maybe why it's so important for people. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and I'm all for betting on yourself. But uh, yeah, it, if you have that full time job as well, it gives you the ability to have that, you know, the ability to make those mistakes and really learn and be able to grow your business from that and, you know, mm -hmm. not quite be operating out of kind of desperation, like you were saying. Yeah, right. And you have so much more money to like, if you save for six months, you have so much more money to play around with versus exactly. oh, quit. I have whatever saved up. I already do. Okay, I'm gonna spend all this it's just way, way better to just save up, be patient, be patient. Business is a long-term game. <laughs> Everyone's listening The overnight success stories of, of your friend that hopped in and made a bajillion dollars in like seven seconds. That's not common. That does not happen. I just look up a, a statistic um, out of all the businesses in the United States. Most of them operate. I think it's like over 50% at a 7.9% profit. So for most people out there, that's even like large companies like Walmart, Walmart, you know, Walmart gets a lot of slack because they're a huge corporation, but Walmart operates off of 3.9% profit. Very, very little. It's th I think 3.9% or less. So anyone who's like, again, considering it or, or knows a friend who's considering it and you're, you're, you're they're they making buku bucks. One, a lot of what you see online, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors you don't know about. Um, especially when you get into consulting, you start seeing some of that stuff and you're like, 
I don't know how your business is even running. But anyways, <laughs> um, there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. Business is just like, I think, um, just like every other walk of life. Like, if you know Betty down the street is doing amazing and she's doing all these different things or, you know, people, celebrities and stuff and influencers, is, you don't know the backstory. There's a lot more stuff going on. So don't compare yourself to others. Don't take a look at – take a look at huge successes for how you can move forward if they're legit and genuine. But I'm, uh, just do your own thing. Be patient with yourself. Uh, if you happen to get rich overnight, congrats. That's <laughs> very rare, and I wish I became rich overnight. That would have been fantastic. <laughs> so I, yeah, again, agree with that kind of stuff. And it's mm -hmm. interesting because when you add in the whole social media piece, sometimes it's a gamble. What you see one business doing, you right. potentially try to pick it up and it doesn't work for you, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about optimizing the sales process mm -hmm. and you know how we can implement that. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing most people don't understand about business, you know, like you hear the customer is always right. Again, cliche, obvious. But people don't understand how deep that actually is. So in any part along any journey, that someone goes through in the buying process. It could be through uh, a pizzeria. Again, it could be through an offline business. It could be an online business. So I'm going through a funnel. So I'm going through an online sales process. You need to treat your customer the best possible, the most rewarding way possible, the most incentivized way possible, and truly tailor every part of the process to their wants and needs. So for online, the online world, what does it look like? One, in any online sales process, you should have upsells, down sales, different product and services you can offer to any uh, customer or lead. Number two is you need to follow up as humanly as possible because what do customers and just people, they're not customers, they're just people, people relate to. They relate to people. I, I have a saying, I don't know if I invented it, but I might have, I'm not sure, <laughs> uh, is people do not buy product and, products and services. People buy people. People buy personality. Yeah. People buy genuine. It's why I've done so well. It's why the best people, the best actually good people, not the smoke and mirrors people, do so well. So in any sales process, you also want to make it as human and as connecting and genuine as possible. So you'll see like a lot of agencies, you'll see a lot of uh, consulting businesses look way too professional, look way too uh, copy and paste of every other business. If you took a look at my site, you take a look at uh, anything I do, usually there's there's some kind of either different twist or there's a lot of rep representation of my family, my friends, other parts of what I do in my business. So then your customers, when they go through any sales process, well, that's, it's a pizzeria, making sure that when your customers buy it, you know, come in, you make sure you always give them uh, mints. You always do X, Y, Z to reward them, to make sure they're happy. Like think about restaurants. How many restaurants do you go to that like the cooks come out and ask how the food was. None, yeah. none. But if that was to happen, you'd be like, oh my God, I can't believe the cook came out. So you have to really amaze the people who are going through any sales process. Um, you have to make sure you're getting as much money from them as possible. As horrible as that sounds, that's your job in business. Your job is to, while giving people what they need and what they want, is to have them pay you as much as they can afford for that. Um, so obviously optimizing for upselling, downselling, reselling. Number two is treating people as, as humanly, I call it this human marketing, using human marketing in everything you do in the process people go through. So all the way from an ad to coming into a store or an ad to hitting a checkout cart uh, to also your follow-up. Most people in follow-up, whether it's texting people, emailing, email follow-up, it's calling, it's messaging, you name it. What most people don't do is follow up from a variety of what I call ways uh and perspectives so usually it's buy uh, there's a sticker here buy this sticker this sloth sticker um come come buy this it's the best you can get and there's a 20 percent discount on it and then they keep sending out emails or in text that same kind of generic messaging or something similar to it where instead you should follow up with here's why this sloth sticker will make you more popular you know i'm just using silly examples but you need to follow up from a, a variety of different ways because in any audience, there's a variety of different kinds of people. So, for example, um, one of you might be more analytical. One of you might be more emotional. One of you might like to see storytelling. One of you might like to see the the gear on the person. Or You know what I'm saying. You have different things you want and need. So, in any audience, 
they're those same kinds of people. So you need to relate in how you're communicating with them. Again, using storytelling, sharing uh, testimonials, stats and statistics, you name it, rewards, bonuses, discounts, all of those different ways to follow up because then you relate to each kind of person and the different kinds of things in each person. So again, I'm very, I love storytelling and I, I like stats. So by using all those different things, you don't just relate to the stats part of me, you also relate to the storytelling part of me. So again, it all comes down to human marketing, human, just, just, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You have to show that in how you operate, again, in the sales process and follow up in your advertising, and that will resonate with your audience and have them want to buy from you because they are, are seeing a business or person that actually cares about them and that actually shows it and that has more than one perspective on how they're promoting themselves. That was a lot. Uh, I oh, also, that was really good, though. Really good. Yes. So <laughs> human, human, be personable. It works best. And I think to add to that is we're always, you know, mistakes are going to happen. Right. And it's how, like, personally, yeah. that business owns it. Right. Yes. That's I, like a big one for me. Like we we did some renos here. I just mm -hmm. got some work done outside and it's like, OK, it looks really good. But A, B and C needs to get fixed. Right. Now, if their response was, oh, whatever, we did the job, it's done. Like we're not coming back then I probably would have done one of those, you know, reviews that wasn't the greatest, but they right, owned it right. and they sent somebody back, they fixed it up. Awesome. So guess what? The yes, there was a problem, but you fix it. And I'm still going to refer you be to other people because I know that you're going to do a good job. Right. And if they were really, if they were really good, what they would do is we are so sorry. You're right. The next time you work with us, we'll do a discount off. Yes, they did. XYZ yeah. plus a guarantee. Okay. How can we do how can we do more business together? And again, that is, yeah. you know, it kind of sounds like it's more salesy or it's more marketing involved, but really again, it's just you constantly in every way possible, again, through a sales process, through advertising, through follow-up, the three main ways of working with the customer or lead is you want to be there for them as much as possible. I've I've had many different similar circumstances, as you do in business <laughs> where things don't work out. People do chargebacks, people do this, people do that. And the best things that I have done that have made business do better is like you're saying exactly is you have to treat the bad experiences as best as possible. Again, trying to, mm -hmm. again, get the person what they want. So if you're pissed off at James cause he did a horrible job on a renovation, James wants you to be happy. So he needs to make sure you are happy, not just happy, even though it's a bad experience, they made it so much better you're going to talk about it because you'd say, wow, James messed up. But then he came back and he gave us a discount. He did this for us and he did this extra work and he even brought us a gift. And then you're amazed. And that in business and as in life, again, this business applies to everything else too. If you do that in your relationships, like with your spouse, when you mess up, like if I upset my girlfriend, this is what I do. One, if I, if I did something wrong, I will always apologize. Always apologize. You know Casey, lovey, dovey. I'd be really kind of nice. Usually then the next day, I'll go out. I don't care if it's at the gas station. I'll go get her flowers. I'll go do X, Y, Z. I'll get her that. And then I'll also ask, you know, are you okay about this still? You forgive me about this? Is everything okay? I do everything I can to make it the, the best situation possible, even though maybe I messed up or maybe someone else messed up. Um, yeah, I, I like business in that aspect. Because usually if you can be really good at business, you can be really good at other things because you know how to deal with people communicate mm -hmm. with them and work with them to find some kind of compromise. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's funny that, you know, when you talk about giving someone a bad review, you notice if you ever look at reviews, there's usually a lot of either five-star reviews, one-star oh, reviews. You don't see too many two, three, and four. People only really focus on those really good or really bad experiences. So you want yeah. to make sure they're good. Yeah. And usually the bad ones are, are really bad. Usually <laughs> I've seen it's like great service. Buy again. These people are the worst people on planet Earth. <laughs> Never work with them, even if they paid you to work with them. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it's even with, with business, but also with like people that leave you reviews. When people leave you reviews, then they go talk about you, to and who, uh, yada, yada. It, it's the same thing. So you always got to know how can, I, how can I compromise? How can I work with people? How can I still retain my own integrity and make a balance? Because again, a lot of times people are 
it's for some people, some people, some reason it seems so hard to say sorry. It seems so hard to like admit it's okay. You can make it wrong. You made a mistake. Move forward with it. Make it a, make it a good situation. Yeah. Absolutely. Now, uh, it, just in terms of business, one thing that I I kind of started to get away from myself because I thought it was you know just listening to some people the, is email because it's kind of the old thing now. But you know, <laughs> listening to some of your content, listening to some other. Oh God! You just, you just like you just broke my neck when you said that. I literally <laughs> you just snapped my neck in half. Keep keep going. Though. Keep going though. <laughs> no, but I, I'm seeing how important uh, email is. Good. So. You know, since I uh, you got got your neck in a knot there, let, let's talk about that a bit. Let's talk about email. Yeah. So email, it, 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 there is a, a negative connotation that it is like not as good as it used to be, which could be true. I don't know like they lack exact analytics around it, but if you look up, at least from what I've seen, it is still the highest converting form of marketing there is. Hmm. Um, that and also too, what email does. As obviously with mass contacts to how many people on your list, 100, 10,000, 100,000, that's obviously a bonus. Number, number two is why I think email is so powerful is because everyone sleeps. You're right. Everyone sleeps on email marketing. Any of the, or the online or offline businesses I talk to, most of them, they're like, I email, like there's an agency. I actually won't name his agency because he may not like it. If he, he, there's an agency friend of mine who I work with and he was doing like no follow-up. And I'm like, well, one, people are on your email list and any list because they want your information. They still have wants and needs that you haven't fulfilled yet. Number two, if you're not communicating with them, are you going to do the manual work of texting and calling every one of them? Which I do prescribe doing all of them at once. But if, unless you're doing all of them at once, if you're, if you're not texting and calling them or messaging them, unless they're seeing your content, they're getting zero communication from you. And number two, what you're also missing out on is, let's just say you have a, you have a thousand leads you're not emailing. How many other businesses who are in your industry or niche are emailing them every single day? And again, it's not just email of promotion. That's that's a huge misconception that so many people just promote, promote, promote. You, you, you do three things in email and any follow-up of any kind, with anyone. You entertain, you educate, or you entice. Entice is basically discounts, rewards, bonuses, all those things. Entertain is funny videos. I've taken videos and sent them out to my email list of me in the shower, of my head in a dryer. This is true. Um, I've done many different very, but guess what? Those actually solved the most because they were genuine and human and they were funny and they, they were relatable. Um, so that's entertaining, funny stuff, weird stuff. You can do just about anything and send it out and people will get engaged. Um, and number three is, I mean, come on, I got to remember, enticing, entertaining, educating. So how-to content, test or tutorials, walkthroughs, you name it. And by especially with email because it's a mass communication tool which you can do you can do mass uh, texting too you can do mass uh dming as well um but i think email is still used so much for everything for facebook send you notifications email google does uh, every service whatever for your logins for everything at some point you end up back in your inbox um so i think that it's under it's underestimated but still is very powerful and two you can still relate with all of these same things you relate to your other with your other methods um and again it's, it's really written copy long form again you can do that with posts it's kind of hard to do with text people don't read super long text a lot of times again with messages people see if i see a again i'm just talking out of my butt but if i see a, a 500 uh character or word uh message on Instagram. I'm not reading that thing most likely. But emails, even if they're longer or, you know, a decent length, you'll read through it. Um, so one, I think just statistically, if you start using email, you'll be pleasantly surprised. And again, also use it, one, in combination with other forms of follow-up. So I'm a proponent. You know, I talked about you, fo you should follow up in multiple different perspectives. You should also follow up for multiple different ways. So if I want a client really badly, I'm going to text them. I'm going to call them. I'm going to email them. I'm going to message them on Facebook. I'm going to comment on their Facebook post. I'm going to, but it, what that does is it puts you in front of their mind everywhere they look. Johnny Brick, Johnny Brick, Johnny Brick, Johnny Brick, Johnny Brick. This guy's annoying, but he's in my face. And again, if you're using different perspectives to follow up with, it's not too annoying because it's at least, oh, there's a discount here. Oh, there's a bonus here. Oh, he sent me a really good article here. Oh, he did a personal video he shot for me and sent it to my phone. So you want to use 
multiple perspectives in multiple ways. So texting, calling, emailing, depending on how bad you want a customer. And also, again, usually the ticket size. If it's a $20 sale, I'm probably not calling someone. You know, if you needed to, you could. But emailing, texting, flying, messaging. But use all of them. Um, don't sleep on email, I'm telling you. Oh, oh, some one more thing. I thought of this too. I don't know if it can be done as well as it can in, in email. But from what I know, with email, if you get into like advanced email segmentation and split testing, there's a lot of fine tuning you can do. So you can't do it with texting, I know for sure. But I don't know if you can do it through Messenger. Um, so when someone, for example, sees a, a, a sales page, but they don't go to your bridge page or they don't go to your checkout page and they exit, you can automate so they get an email to get them to return back into your funnel. Same with the checkout cart. They get in the checkout cart, they abandon. I have email automations for one of the books I, I, I self published that they immediately get an email. Hey, we saw you didn't check out. Here's a discount code to get back, right back in right away. Um, and also then you can split test emails. You, you can do engagements based off of people are, are active, clicking on emails. If they're not active, clicking on emails. If they're just leads versus customers. And if they're leads versus customers, again, if they're customers and they're clicking a lot, then they should get emails that are more salesy because they are showing interest by clicking and being active. There's so much more in the email. I want you to do, I will also, I will also, after this, I will give you lots of my emails that are kind of segmented like this. I'll give those to you just, just because, because I'm telling you, email, email is the, the <laughs> bread and butter. Email is just, the, it's just amazing. So in regards to that, it's funny because I was thinking about all the emails that I get through, all, uh, you know, every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong here. I'm all about the title. So I'm not going to, or the subject line, sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to open every email every day yes. from a company. But if it's like, oh, Mother's Day discount or Father's Day discount. Okay, let right. me check and see what's up. I got to get something here, right? Um, and oh, I was going to say something else. Oh, how often? Are you recommending that you? Send I love emails? this because it's yeah. <laughs> such a horrible thing that people don't email every day or every two days or every three days. You're going to be annoying. No, no. Here, here here's why. This gets me so <laughs> happy. Think about again. If if I'm selling an agency services, tell me how many other agencies are there? A lot. There's like thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands. If I'm selling bread, how many bakeries are there? Thousands and thousands and thousands. And most likely, if someone is wanting my services, they're probably on a few other email lists or they're seeing content from in other platforms for other businesses. You need to stand out. And this is why in all business, in, just in, in all, all walks of life, you need to stand out. You need to be the forefront most often emailing, not like 20 a day. That's annoying. Like there's levels to this stuff. 20 is annoying. One a day, if I if I poke you once in the head a day, you're probably not going to be too happy. Maybe even twice, I poke you in the head and then in the neck. You're not going to be too happy. Three times, maybe a little bit. So I advise every business once a day minimum. And again, it doesn't have to be, like, like you just said, you just said that something different in the subject line that is more personalized to you, mm -hmm. you go, oh, maybe I'll click on this. I'm the same way. You know, I usually only click on like really like well copywritten, like different headlines. I'm like, what did you just say? That's different. And I click on it again, which is why using different perspectives in how you copyright and do messaging is so important. Um, but then again, like, like those businesses that are doing that are doing that right. So like trying to sell you again, also you should know your customers. Well, this also gets to the best just like in, in relationships, I should know my wife well or my girlfriend well because then I know what she wants. You know, it, it all relates together. So for example, let's say he pissed you off. He pissed you off. You you did he did something that you do not like. And he just does it like every six months. You don't know why. <laughs> and it just irritates you so much. You're not talking to him today. If he wants you back, this is what again this is what I would do sometimes what I do is he could he could actually email you. That, that would surprise you. You'd be like you would probably laugh so hard and be like, did you just email me? <laughs> See, I told you email is effective. I told you. Would you just email me? I love you. You are so sweet. You look beautiful today. Sorry, I'm bad sometimes. <laughs> again, using personality, using personality in a different way to follow up, literally with a relationship, um, is what works so good. So you can do that, get you a bear, a few, a few different things. And in business, again, you do that by the same thing as, you know, 
again, also something that I see most businesses do, especially in the online world, but offline too, is they have like, again, that one main offer. So for example, if I'm selling, uh, say protein powder, I have one main sales page. I'll just, I'm not talking about like the, the ways of following up, like the texting and the email, just like the actual thing I'm sending someone. I send them usually a business sense, one video, or they send one sales page. Maybe they use different messaging and different emails, right? But they keep sending you, say if it's a, if a Valentine's gift for your hubby, they keep sending you to that same sales page for the hubby. And maybe they send different things, the discounts, to this, to that, to this. So you keep opening them, but you see the same sales page and it's just the same exact offer. You're not interested. If you, if you see it for the 20th time, you're not interested in the 25th time, are you? No. So also what you want to do, and most businesses need to do, is they use you need to use multiple different perspectives, again, in your follow-up, what you're actually sending. So you should have, any business should have between three to five different videos and or sales pages for single products. So if I'm selling a membership to a gym, I want one, stung, uh, one sales page telling the story of the gym. I want one that just comprises of testimonials. I want one that just comprises of how much uh, the stats and st figures stack up for my clients and weight they're losing and stuff. You want to use that. Um, so yeah, in subject lines, that's huge. Something else that's huge, and I think this is true, I would have to test it, um, is using emails in succession to one another. So if you get one day a random email, that's another random email, that's another random email, without them kind of tying together, usually customers are in leads aren't as interested because it's just kind of random where if it's, I'm doing a promotion, like actual promotion, I'm saying out, here's a discount for this single product. Now, do you know how we came up with that discount? Do you know what goes behind the creation? You have to use things in unison with another. So a really good company, they would use everything I just said. And then they'd write like a story, almost like each subject line is a story connecting the last email to the next. Emails, emails, good guys. <laughs> now, for those of us who slept on email or we're just getting started, how do you build up your email list? This is something that honestly it sucks. Lead generation is the most difficult thing to do for any business. And it's it's why think about it too, you know, people say there's there's market saturation, which they're kind of is in some industries, right? Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, there really isn't because name one business that has ever ran out of leads or customers. Never, never. I can't think personally. I thought about like, has anyone ever like ran out of people to talk to? No, you never do. Um, so it just goes to show that one, you're never going to run out. Don't worry. You can't run out. There's always people that will buy from you. It could be not just people who want your stuff, but that who don't know they want your stuff yet. It could be co uh, competitors. You can market to them. Um, so get back to your question. Lead generation. Lead generation is, there's two ways. One's really, sorry, they're both really hard. I'll be honest, they're both really hard, but one is quicker. Depends on one, people's budget, and two, if they want things to happen quickly. So I do recommend people do paid ads. You should have paid ads. Doesn't really matter the platform you're using. They're all pretty much the same. You know, people go, oh, well, Facebook, well, LinkedIn, well, YouTube. Every kind of person uses every one of those platforms, all of them. Um, like, I, I talk with the own company a long time ago. They're like, well, I don't think my customers are on Facebook. And I'm like, Facebook has like 5 billion users. You don't think any chiropractors <laughs> are on Facebook. None of them. None of them share pictures of their kids at barbecues. Um, so I do recommend paid ads. However, someone should only run paid ads if they themselves have thoroughly learned how to run them. So like you've gone through at least like legitimately three courses like three courses, not one, three, free and paid. You need to learn how to do it yourself very well because otherwise if you don't run ads right, especially for Google and Bing, they're bad for uh, a lot of bot, bot traffic. Um, you will run your money out very quickly if you don't know how to run ads. And also if you don't know the rest of business, because some people know how to generate leads, but they don't know how to convert them. Like we just went over in the follow-up and the sales process. Um, so you need to also have those things in check before you, before anyone runs any advertising of any kind, I prescribe you have a decent, this would be amazing, decent sales process and a follow-up process put in place because when you put people through, then they'll actually convert and get you money back. So once you've done that, paid advertising, but make sure either you know it at a high level or you've got to hire it out. If you don't, you have to hire it out. There's people who do it full-time who are much better than you think you are. That's what I do. I hire it out because 
I I did it and I, I tested, I tested, I tested, and I, I could have made it successful, but I'd rather, instead of me wasting ad spend, I'd rather pay someone who knows how to do it and can do it profitably right away, or at least within a reasonable time. Mm-hmm. Two, organic. Organic is great if you can build up a following, but it takes a lot of time. So organic lead generation literally just means creating content across any platform of any kind. It could be social media, it could be articles, SEO, you name it. What I recommend is again, I'm a, I'm an all out guy is both at once. So any business that get, again, that wants to do exceptionally well, it is a lot. What I'm going through is a lot like mastering your sales process, mastering your follow process, mastering your ads, your organic uh, lead generation too. It's a lot. But if you want to become very profitable and run your business very profitably, once these things are set up, it's not going to take as much time to like manage them. It's, it's mainly getting this, them set up in the first place. So I recommend um, while you or someone in your business is following up with customers in multiple ways from different perspectives, when you have a sales process set up, they're already going to be going through it in from multiple ways and perspectives. The, also, your advertising, you do paid uh, ads while doing organic. So the reason why this also is so effective, the, the paid lead generation with organic lead generation and using the follow-up and sales process thing I went with is, again, people are so distracted nowadays. People have so many other competitors in their inbox that if they don't see you from all these different directions, when they're scrolling through Facebook, they're not following you, and they're not seeing your messaging from a paid ad on Facebook too, and they're not getting your emails because you guys don't email. Uh, <laughs> but you get what I'm saying? If they don't have all these things working at them once, the company that – is doing those things will get them as a customer while you won't. Mm-hmm. They might not have as good a product or service. They might not have the best price point. They might be even charge more than you. But because their consistent messaging is in your eyes again and again and again and again, you start to build familiarity and people start to build familiarity with the product and service and want to work with it naturally. So I think people need to do all these things at once or if they're not going to do it themselves, they can either set them up so they're automated or they can hire it out. I prescribe paid lead generation with organic lead generation. Create content. So wherever platform your followers are on, they're going to see you in one place or another. They're going to get emails from you. They're going to get something from you. Oh, that's all good. And mm-hmm. the, the one thing that you mentioned in there as well, and you know, maybe I'll, I'll get you to jump on another soapbox is uh, search and <laughs> search engine optimization. <laughs> Yeah, I see. We we'll do another podcast for that because <laughs> SEO. I've re- I've recently started getting into SEO. Um, SEO is the most complex layer of stuff, business stuff. I've started doing recently. SEO is a whole. I do have for people who want to learn about SEO that are way better than me, extraordinarily better than me. Kyle Roof and Matt Diggity are some of the best SEO experts you can listen to. And also Kyle Roof's Page Optimizer Pro. It's a tool that what people don't realize about SEO is that like Google can't tell if your content is good necessarily, if, it, if it's phrased a certain way, if, it, if it's going to help the customer or audience the best. What Google has is it's, it's like a robot. It has a formula for dictating if you use these words in these certain places, these amount of times we will rank you. And Kyle Roof, I'm giving him so much free publicity. Um, which he has a lot of, he has a lot of anyways. So uh, <laughs> Kyle Roof tested this in an SEO contest. I forgot what it was for, right? But it was for, let's say it was for selling the sticker. I don't know why this is on my desk. But they're selling the sticker, right? He, you know what Lor, Lorem Ipsum is? Mm-hmm. Lorem Ipsum is like randomly generated, like, like Latin text, right? Yep. He had a page, an article that was 95% Lorem Ipsum, just random gibberish. But because he's really good at SEO and his tool he made makes this a lot easier for you, he knows where to place things and how many times to say a certain word um, and where they should go. He did that. He won the contest. He ranked number one and right. 90% of the stuff. So Google Google didn't read any of the, the bull crap gibberish. It just read where things Increase. were said, how many times they were said and where. So I don't know the science behind it, but Page Optimizer Pro is an excellent SEO tool. I have used it. Every article I've used it on so far of ours for our blog, within it takes about eight to ten days for Google to like re-index. Uh, all of them went up. Every single one of them went up at least a minimum to 
between probably an average of four to 15 spots. Oh, well. Which, if you're on second or third page, a lot of people are, they can't get to first. It gets you the first page. It's a lot more traffic than you're getting basically zero on second page. So mm -hmm. um, definitely recommend Page Optimizer Pro. Kyle Roof, Matt Diggity. Uh, Neil Patel is also good, but those two are for me, and that's why I relate to them better. They're a little bit more personable. Okay. Well, yeah, definitely we'll have to do another episode on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh... SEO is crazy. <laughs> Wow. And this, like, there's so much to talk about, but we covered a lot in this time. That's for sure, John. Uh, I don't know. Did you have anything else? Yeah. So, so one question I kind of like to ask, and I just want to, you know, uh, kind of look back and mm -hmm. for, you know, for yourself now being uh, you know, 24 year old John, if you were to go back in time and have a conversation with, with John, when you were just starting your business, what would you share with him? I would tell him one, uh, keep doing you. Fortunately, I followed a really good path and I would actually say, listen to others less, less, less of what friends and certain family thinks. Don't listen to them. Think of only the people who are telling you and moving you forward because I actually, that, that is one thing I think that kind of helped me back was, and I think this helped most people back is you, you're so concerned with what Bob down the street or your, your aunt Jan thinks of your business or thinks of what you, who you are, what you're doing, that you, that you don't do what is necessary to grow yourself or grow your business. And number two, I will have told myself to do a lot more. Like it sounds like I was moving things along and I was doing business or whatever, but I was, I was gaming a lot. I still hung out with friends, different things. I would still do those things. Well, um, I want to tell myself to push a lot harder because, and not to underestimate myself. Like, especially right now, um, I'm getting into like quite a bit of public speaking. Like I'm going to be speaking for ad world. I'll be speaking for most likely I'm in talks with them. We'll see. I, I, I think I can talk with them and convince them. I'm um, affiliate world, which is huge or affiliate summit. Sorry. Um, and a few different events as well. Uh, a podcast. This is going to be horrible. If, if he hears this, I hope he doesn't hear this. There's a <laughs> podcast owner of the platform. We both use, I will be speaking for his event and I forgot the name of the event. <laughs> Anyways, I, from what I know, uh, I have to iron out, uh, the presentation, I'll be speaking for that. Uh, dang it. And I will tell myself that I, you can be doing a lot more from what you're doing now. Like I could have been speaking, I could have been doing more consulting, I could have been doing this stuff probably when I was 21, 20. I, I, I completely thought that I think people overestimate because they're comparing themselves to all the big successes in their industry and niche and people they know. I was comparing myself too much to what I saw. I'm like, oh, this person must know so much. And slowly as I got more into consulting and stuff, I started seeing like the back offices of some of these people's stuff. And I'm like, wow, I'm not impressed. I know way more. Real quick story. I know we're, we're, we're going on. Oh, we're good. Real quick story. <laughs> um, there was a lady who I won't name. This is one of the falling outs I have. Real, real early. This is when I was broke. I need, I need work. I do thank, I'm thankful for because she gave me some work and some money in my pocket. Um, this lady did uh, speaking from stage. She charged, I forgot her product or service or something. It was $15,000. She sold, which is high ticket. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, and I was impressed. I was like, wow, but I'm working with this woman. She was paying me very little, uh, which is why I stopped working with her, but she was paying me something. Um, so anyways, she goes, you know, of course you can go learn in this back office. At this time I was pretty, pretty learned up, but still could learn some stuff. And I'm like, okay, cool. $15,000 product I'm learning from this back office. There should be a ton of stuff back here. Like I can just, this is going to make my business explode. Went back there. I'm like 18 and I'm like, I could have taught this in like an hour, a $15,000 course. I could have taught it in an hour mm -hmm. on stage, like on stage in front of and as many people as you want to throw at me. So I, I that experience and many others have made me realize that some of the people you, that you're envying or that you're jealous of, that you're like, oh my God, they're so successful. It's crazy, but they're not where you think they are. So don't worry about what other people are doing. I would just tell myself and other people, focus on yourself and realize that you can charge and be a lot more than you already are um, because you're already worth more than you are compared to the people that you probably are jealous of or, or want to be like. <laughs> um, there's other people too that I'm just... I am amazed. I, I see what's going on. I won't say names, but I'll be in the back end of what they're doing. And I'm like, how do you operate business? But mm -hmm. that's what they go to me for. 
Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and things always come out, right? Things that also that's also true. Things usually always reveal themselves in the end in some way, shape, or form. You go, oh, oh no, that happened to you. Well, since I knew it was going on, that does make sense. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, so John, if we want to, uh, if we want to learn more, where do we find you? I know I, I put the website up for any for anybody who's listening. It's John Weberg, as uh, J O N no H W E B E R G dot com. And uh, you're on YouTube as well. You have a lot of yes, content on there. YouTube channel is great. Um, and also, I should have told you this earlier, but it's cool. Uh, the blog, e, if you want to learn more SEO stuff and kind of study some of the articles we're doing, E, like the letter E, money, peeps, P-E-E-P-S, emoneypeeps.com too. Um, that's where we're starting starting the SEO journey. We hired two SEO agencies. We paid them $40,000. They were really bad at what they were doing. So we stopped working with them and learned it ourselves. We're much better than the two agencies we paid forty thousand dollars. Another <laughs> another great story of how people you even hire to do things are not as good as you are after learning it for six months. <laughs> um, true story, true story. Um, so yeah, johnweaver.com, mostly YouTube. If you want to follow me, go to YouTube. I do a lot of videos on there, I'm active on there, and just also reach out to me, message me on any social media. I like to chat with people, I'll probably help you out for a lot for free because I usually do that because I like working with people. And I'm, uh, I appreciate you both very much for having me on. This was absolutely wonderful. Uh, thanks so oh, much, thank John. You, we yeah. learned a lot, and we know that everybody else who listens will definitely be able to take lots away. Thank you yeah, so we, much. Yeah, we definitely appreciate you coming on. And for everyone listening and watching, thank you for letting us disrupt your everyday. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.